Hello, welcome to the first live stream of the year. Um, unfortunately, I am full of cold today, so um, <laughs> you get a husky voice. Um, I cannot believe there's already <laughs> almost 70 people here. So welcome to everyone, all and new and young and just everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Can somebody just let me on chat that you can hear me all right? Because <laughs> I'm kind of croaking away. And even though it looks like I'm not wearing any makeup, I'm wearing like a load of makeup just to make me look like a human being. So I am going to uh, get straight to the point, hopefully. And um, we are gonna talk about executive functioning today and um, of course the irony is that uh, I don't know how long I've been planning this live and just now as I was sitting here watching the early people on the chat I'm like <laughs> I have to write the script well not the script but I have to write my notes quick do the google search I don't know anyway um, welcome to everybody now there's 90 people here there's no way I can keep up with the chat like I just can't. So, you know, you can use super chats. Um, I will try and read something at some point. Other than that, I'm just going to talk because that's why you're here, right? To hear me monologue. Um, I do have some very exciting information about a Discord channel or server. What do you call it? Discord channel, I think. Um, so for those of you who were bugging me about Discord, your wishes have been granted. Um, so hello, everybody. I like I can't even, the chat's moving so fast, I can't even see, I can't. So I'm just gonna go into the subject, which is executive functioning. Let me scroll up to my notes, cause like I was literally just <laughs> writing them at the last time. That was basically my school life, was doing absolutely everything last minute. Um, so the first thing that I wanna say at the beginning is that uh, I've got a lot of questions, which is basically like, how do I get my life together? How do I get organized? How do I do this? And <laughs> I just want to say, if I knew all the answers to that, I would probably be a millionaire, if not uh, just a gusquillionaire. Um, I am autistic and I suspect ADHD, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and <laughs> I don't have it all together. I really don't. Um, as you guys might have seen from my day in the life, uh, the daily stuff is the stuff where I really struggle and the social stuff and the sensory stuff I have to manage, but the executive functioning is really where I feel like I'm just, I've got no clue what's going on. So I kind of basically just lurk around on groups and steal people's good ideas. <laughs> and then I'm like, I made a video about this. Um, but yeah, I, I struggle with it. I do. And that's why it's nice to talk about it. Um, Somebody wants me to say hi, mum. I saw that. Aren't you lucky? Hello, mum. Not my mum. Somebody else's mum. I don't think my mum is watching. I'm not sure. I don't think she she can live chat. Not sure. Um, right. So now that I've given that disclaimer that I don't know all the answers, I'm just putting stuff out on the internet like you guys. Well, not like you guys, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, YouTube is edited. It's not real life. It's an illusion. Um, so somebody asked me, can you explain what executive functioning actually is? And luckily for you guys, I can. Um, it's basically a term and, okay, I'm already trying to say another sentence before I finish this one. So I'm going to read it from my notes. It's a term used to describe higher level cognitive thought processes that generally take place or are sort of implicated in the frontal lobe of the brain. And for those of you who don't know about brains, the frontal lobe is like our most advanced lobe. Um, it's like what people think make us human. Um, other animals do have frontal lobes, but they're not quite so advanced as humans. So all of the higher level cognitive processes take place, we think, in the frontal lobe. Um, and executive functioning that is sometimes referred to as mental skills but I'm not really sure how I feel about that because a skill is something that you can learn and I'm not sure 
people, autistic people, people with ADHD, it's not about being lazy or unwilling to learn, or it's not about being stupid or anything like that. It's it's more how we're wired. So calling them a mental skill, I think, isn't quite right. Um, because if we can't, we can't necessarily learn the skill, but we might be able to learn a strategy. And there's a difference. Um, so why are we even talking about this? Because autistic people and ADHD people all typically have impaired executive functioning to some degree. Um, but I think it's something that is far better known among the ADHDers. Um, and autism is normally more associated with the social skills or sensory issues and, you know, wanting, liking routine and stuff like that. But executive functioning is a huge part of autism and the overlap between autism and ADHD is actually really, really big. And I will talk about that later because it's been on my mind recently. Um, and for me personally, it's not the same for every autistic person, but it's the executive functioning that makes me feel like I have a disability. It, it, it is the stuff that impairs me day to day. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I don't really like the implication that this is like a disorder, like executive dysfunction or something. Um, and, you know, even just calling them higher level thought processes implies that if you can't do these things, then you are like a lower being, you're like a primate or a less intelligent or less human. And I don't really feel like that's the case, just because you kind of struggle in one area. Um, because I think that the way that our brains are wired and the way that we think can be very useful sometimes. And this is directly because of our unique way of functioning. It's just, it doesn't quite work in the world that we have today, um, where life is, there's a lot of admin, there's a lot of organizing that you have to do. Life was simpler back in the day, I think. Um, okay, there was a higher chance of you getting eaten by a wild boar, but like, you didn't have to do paperwork, you didn't have to you know, worry about replying to school or sending this email and stuff like that. It's was, it was simpler. Um, so I feel kind of like constantly overloaded by the demands of living in society, whether it's like you get another letter that could have been an email or you get, you know, there's so much to organize. Um, and I do have quite a complicated life, but <laughs> even for people who are just existing, you still have to pay tax. You still have to do all of these things that require your attention and organization and stuff like that. Um, so the executive functioning is really like the adulting bit. And I know some people really hate that term, but I use it. So, um, and it's, it's most noticeable, certainly for me around practical things in, in everyday life. Um, it's not really about how good you are at particular things. It's about your general ability to think like an executive. That's what I actually twigged. I've been calling it executive functioning for however long and it only just occurred to me why it's called that because you have to function like an executive well that, that occurred to me today and I was like oh that makes sense you know like the, your manager is the one who organizes like okay where does the workload go and how long is this going to take and well let's do a gantt chart and stuff like that so anyway um yeah there's no chance there's no chance I can catch up on the chat I'm just going to keep going <laughs> but I will catch up on my tea. I'm drinking mint tea today because I didn't have any ginger in the house or lemon. Um, so somebody said, I'm gonna need a big glass of wine for this. And I actually <laughs> don't have any wine. Oh. oh, right. Anyway, oh my gosh, 167 people. Hello to you all. Um, so yes, the, the executive functioning, um, it controls various things, which I will talk about individually in, in a little bit more detail. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a big overlap with ADHD. So from the outside, it kind of looks the same. Poor executive functioning looks very similar to somebody with ADHD. And we might look disorganized, lazy, and stressed. And I, that's actually kind of a good <laughs> slogan for a t-shirt, isn't it? Um, but that's sort of how we look on the outside, especially like when I think back to my school years, it was disorganized, lazy, stressed, must have been how teachers perceived me. Um, 
And the interesting thing I did find out during um, my research is looking into executive functioning. And it, it does seem to be impaired during teenage years because there is obviously a lot of brain development that happens during your teenage years, even for neurotypicals. Um, so if you think about like what a, a stereotype of teenagers, we think of them as being disorganized, lazy and stressed, right? Or stressful, whatever I said. Um, and so teenagers actually have I wouldn't say impaired, developing executive function. Um, but I don't know whether part of the, the sort of developmental developmental condition of autism is that we never progressed past our teenage years. That would explain a lot. Um, I do kind of feel like I'm just stuck there. But anyway, um, I'm not the sort of person that, that I, I think teenagers are actually really cool. I volunteer um, uh, with a summer camp called Camp Quest. And every year um, I spend a week with teenagers and I enjoy it. I like teenagers. I think they are unfairly maligned. But possibly that's because I over relate to the um, disorganized, lazy and stressed side of it. Um, but anyway, when I was um, frantically Googling executive functioning for this live chat, um, I was trying to find subtypes. And you know, when you Google, they suggest questions that you could ask. And so it was like, what are the three types of executive functioning? And I click on that. And then there was another question, what are the five types, what are the seven types? And it's like, there are no actual agreed upon subtypes. Um, Psychologists have made a lot of models, but they're extremely theoretical and not very practical. They're not really based in sort of reality. Um, psychologists are a bit like that sometimes, at least sort of research psychologists, um, you know, like, oh, I've made a really great model, but nobody can understand it and we can't apply it to, to everyday life. So it's incredibly impractical. Um, but there are various different models of, you know, attention and organization and categorization and things like that. But what does it actually mean? It doesn't really help us. Um, sorry, just keep looking at my tissues because I think I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> so attractive, right? Um, so, yeah, it's not really clear from these models how it looks in everyday life. I mean, I've studied psychology and I still didn't really get what they were talking about. Um, and I, well, okay, I tried a bit to get what it was on about, but I don't think it's helpful. It's not practical strategies. It's not what we're struggling with in our lives right now. So um, let me just see if any, no, no, I can't keep up with the chat. This is like the first chat where I'm like, I just can't even. If you at me, it highlights actually, and I can see it, I don't know. Somebody said, it's not that we don't progress, it's that our brain develops at a different pace and order. And I think that's true, yes. Talking about being a teenager, I mean, obviously we, are, we don't have the brains of a teenager because we are adults, unless you're a teenager <laughs> watching this, and then you do. But um, essentially autism and probably possibly ADHD, it's not imbalances, it's not disorders, it's just neurological wiring that is atypical. Um, and of course, we know that in, in society, if you are atypical, you know, you are shunned and labeled and, and unfairly maligned. Anyway, oh, so many chats, so many chats. <laughs> now everybody's doing it. I can't read them all. <laughs> Hello, Andy. Um, you guys should have a look at Indy Andy's uh, YouTube channel because he also does a lot of videos about autism and he deserves like, he deserves more subscribers. So you go check him out, Indy Andy. Indy, like, Indy music, no, Andy, like, Andy music. Um, <laughs> anyway, right. So I'm gonna start talking about the different it's not really types of executive function, just different, different executive functions, I suppose. I don't know how, I don't know how to refer to it. The language is a bit confusing. Um, so I'll start with inertia. Now, autistic inertia is something that I am very uh, familiar with. And if you don't know, inertia is basically like, um, this is like GCSE physics or something. You know, if you have um, an object, inertia means it stays still until you get a whack. Right, and then it carries on, but it carries on until something slows it down. And most of the time it's air. <laughs> it's been a while actually. I don't think I've ever explained inertia to anyone. So I think I did all right there. Um, 
but if you imagine yourself as you know an object um inertia basically refers to the fact that you need to kick up your butt to get going and then once you get going you can't stop um and this is very this is very familiar to me um i it's not that i lack motivation i want to do a lot of things and i like doing things and it's not that i'm lazy because i'm uh, 2020 is the year that i reject the label of lazy for myself because i have to look back at the things that i've done in my life and say okay this is not what a lazy person does so i am no longer calling myself lazy and i would encourage you to do the same thing autistic inertia <laughs> That's what we call it now. Um, and the thing that I realized is that inability to start, right? The problem is that the starting bit doesn't happen at the beginning. The starting bit happens after you've done some planning on how to start. So say you've got a really big project. You don't like say, okay, I'm gonna start and you just start the essay, whatever. Let's say it's an essay. You don't just start the essay. Um, <laughs> you, the actual starting bit, which means you actually can start, is the pre-starting planning bit. And that's always the bit that got me because I'm like, I want to start this. But no, you have to plan it. You have to break it down into small enough chunks. Because if you don't do that, you don't know where to start and you cannot start. And this is something that sounds incredibly obvious all of this sounds obvious when you say it out loud, but it's it's not. Somebody asked me, why do I have a toilet roll by the computer? It's because I'm using it for a tissue because I don't see any reason to have like huge tissues when toilet roll works fine. And this is bamboo as well. So it's nice and soft on my delicate nose. <laughs> Judgment. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in a bit of a funny mood today. Um, I have not had any, any meds before you say that I'm on some sort of NyQuil induced I don't know. So yeah, the the autistic inertia, if you don't know where to start, you will never be able to start. And that's the thing is like just saying, okay, okay, I'm going to start now. That's not enough because you have to actually sit there and think about where you start. And in order to know where to do that, you have to break it down into chunks. And so there's this whole stage that I just, it doesn't come naturally. I didn't just figure it out. It's like, I have to remember, oh yeah, let's break this down to start with. Um, so the flip side of the autistic inertia is not being able to stop. Um, and for me, it's not that I can't stop. It's that it took so much effort to start the project. And once I'm on a roll, you know, I'm, I'm reached this magical state of flow or whatever they call it. Um, I know that if I stop, then it requires me to start again. Does this make sense? Like I, <laughs> and I know how hard it was for me to start. So I don't want to stop. So it's actually, it's not that I can't stop for me. It's actually like, I don't want to stop. Um, I can't stop when I'm in hyper-focus, but that's something more to do with attention. Sort of inertia is like you know, motivation a little bit more. Um, anyway, so yeah, autistic inertia. Um, I have a Facebook friend who, um, shared her, um, a list of strategies that she wrote down with her therapist, um, of, of doing things for, for different difficulties in her life. Um, I'm going to shamelessly steal it. I did actually ask him permission to steal it. Um, but she... Uh, wrote down some strategies for getting things done. And I think these are all pretty useful for um, combating inertia. Um, so number one is to write things down. And this was actually something that I did last week. I was in, a, my executive functioning was dreadful last week. It was really, really bad. Um, so my autism coach told me just to write things down and the temptation to write things down and then go to another thought was just there, but he, he's, he was just like, no, no, just keep writing every thought that you have down and eventually you will run out of thoughts. So brain dumping is really, really recommended, if, especially if you feel like really stuck in life and like you feel like you can't think because there's so much on your mind and nothing's organized, just 
dump it all down. Honestly, it works. I, I really was just, I, it was almost a physical sensation of thoughts squeezing in my brain. Write it all down and it was much better. And then from the, the, the problem I have is I, I try and write it down and I try and organize it as we go along. But no, that's not what you do. Write it all down. Then you can look at it all and then you can start to organize it into categories or saying, OK, I can do this now. This is not going to take me very long. But the brain dump is the, the sort of catharsis anyway. Um, so more strategies for getting things done from an autistic inertia point is um, using songs to get into a certain frame of mind. So you might use music to motivate you when you go to the gym. That's a really obvious example that people do, but what about playlists to motivate you to clean? Um, I was trying to think of like a cheesy song that would be like a cleaning song, but I don't know. Just like I would say really upbeat rock music um, is cleaning music for me, getting things done. Um, setting alarms on phone. I don't personally like alarms on my phone because it makes me pick up my phone and then I will be looking at something else. So I don't personally use that. You could use an alarm on the cooker, maybe. Alarm on, just as long as you remember where you set it, because otherwise it will scare you. <laughs> um, so it says here, use the sledgehammer approach to get hard things done. Um, now what's the sledgehammer approach? It's not delicate. It is basically just doing as much, the, the back, what is it called? Breaking? Breaking the camel's back? Is that the is that the idiom I'm looking for? I'm not sure. You break the <laughs> I don't know actually. Idioms always get me when I have to say them out loud. Mm. That's very autistic, isn't it? Um, you know, the 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 bulk of the the stuff, hit it with a sledgehammer. Don't worry about perfection. Don't worry about like breaking other things off over here. Just, you know, sledgehammer it. And that means that if you are writing an essay, for example, or writing or like a blog post or doing any big piece of work, right? This is actually something that I did do quite well when I was at university was, um, you know, just start writing, start writing and don't worry if it's rubbish. And that you can apply that to anything that isn't writing. If any task, like do things, but don't worry if it's bad because you can always go back and correct it, you know, unless you can't. But <laughs> that's a different problem then, isn't it? Um, so that's one method. Um, something that is also helpful that I do find hard to stick to is um, scheduling when things on your to-do list are going to get done. Because it's all very well having a to-do list. I don't have a to-do list because um, it gets overwhelming and I have too much to do. So I did actually do a video a while ago about a different uh, a, a quadrant format for a to-do list. So having putting them in different categories and then you can kind of like tackle things based on your mood. But putting to-do list items on your calendar rather than having them as a, on a sort of theoretical, oh, I can do this anytime, that's good. But that's not, is that so much about autistic inertia? I'm not sure. Um, and I would also say, this is a good one actually, but it's got me off on a brain tangent again. Um, for autistic inertia, if you are struggling to start something, you might be looking too much at the bigger picture. And I know that allegedly autism is all about looking at the details. You can't see the wood for the trees or something like that. That was the right idiom. Um, I actually find that sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I am so worked up about the bigger picture that I can't see the first the, the, the details. Um, and so the suggestion is to focus on the next step and not the big picture. And I also find that helps from an anxiety point of view. If you're doing something, I don't know what big theoretical pro projects I'm even talking about, but if you focus on the next step, what do I need to do to get a little bit closer to where I want to be? So it could it, it's not necessarily a project. You could just apply that principle to your life as well. You know, let's say you want to be a an artist or whatever. What is the, the first small step that you could do to get you one step closer to that goal? And it might be buy a paintbrush, something like that. It's a weird example actually. But the principle is there is don't worry so much about doing everything. Don't worry about all those different things. Just worry about one thing, the next thing. 
And this person actually referenced the Frozen 2 song, The Next Right Thing, which I really love Frozen 2. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to sing it because I suspect I'll get some sort of copyright strike and I'm full of cold. Um, so that was Autistic Inertia. I am going to have to speed things up if I'm going to get through all of these. <laughs> I love to talk to myself on the internet. Um, da, 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 da. I'm still trying to see your chats. I can't even see. It's going too fast. I can't see the highlighted ones because I'm looking at my notes. And then by the time I look back anyway. Um, right. Paying attention. Yes. Something that is really hard to do when you are live streaming. Um, paying attention. Now, this is something that obviously... ADHD, ADD, they have attention in the name. They are an attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, attention is extremely complicated. I did do a little bit of attention, do attention. What, I, I learned about it when I was at, at university. It's also a bit, when it's done theoretically, it's extremely boring. So there's that. Um, and so it's it's very much always seen as, as an ADHD thing, but I think it just goes equally for autism as well. And I think that the struggles with attention are when the subject is uninteresting to us. I struggle to, I, I can't pay attention to somebody talking about, I'm trying to think of something exceptionally boring, I don't know, sport. I don't like sport. Like it, I will leave rooms with sport in them. Um, <laughs> any kind of sport apart from gymnastics. I like gymnastics, but um, so if somebody is talking to me about sport and like, oh, I don't know, it's the Super Bowl, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm I, I cannot participate in that conversation. I, I can't I can't even pay attention to it. Um, but the flip side of paying attention is that when something is interesting. We can pay attention. We can pay really, really, really good attention, and that's called hyperfocus, um, which is something that is common to ADHD and autism. And hyperfocus, I think, might be one of the things that many of us—I don't want to say most of us because I don't want to speak for anyone—but many of us see as a superpower. You know, there's a lot of this whole inspirational autism is my superpower thing going on. And I don't really know how I feel about that sort of rhetoric, but hyperfocus, I do believe, can be our superpower if we can harness it for the greater good. It's like Elsa from Frozen 2, you know? <laughs> she has to learn to harness her ice powers, and we have to learn how to harness our what was I saying? Uh, the, the thing power. What was I saying? Oh my gosh, hyperfocus. <laughs> I am proving so many points as I'm talking right now, aren't I? In my defense, it's, it is exceptionally difficult to do this. I would like to see you try and do this. Uh, <laughs> so um, I do think that hyperfocus can be a superpower. And I think it can be if you know how to use it and not let it negatively impact your life. Like, it's not a superpower playing computer games for 10 hours straight without taking a break. <laughs> like, that's not a superpower. Um, you might enjoy it, but that's not really, that's not good for us. It's not good to ignore your bodily functions and your, it's, you know, don't do that. Um, oh, I mean, do it, but, you know, do what you like. But I don't think it's particularly good for anyone. Um, but if you have a project to work on, say you are doing coding or writing, that sort of thing, where you have a big project and you have to sit there and focus, and you have measures in place to keep you and your family sane, um, then I think hyperfocus is a great tool, and I think it is what sets us apart and makes us special and makes us gives us the potential to achieve great things. I'm not saying that we all have to achieve great things, by the way. There is nothing wrong with just living a life and being happy. But I think that hyper-focus is the thing. I mean, so for example, a few years ago, when I was diagnosed with celiac disease, um, I got into gluten-free blogging because, like, I want to be a gluten-free blogger. That was when blogging was a thing. Oh, my gosh. Um, and uh, I had a really hard time at a temp job. 
which I'll um, maybe I'll talk about uh, work in another another live stream. Um, so I just I'd, I'd quit my job to p pursue um, blogging. <laughs> in hindsight, it was a really stupid idea, but I did it, um, and I wrote a book. I I wrote a recipe book for gluten-free baking at Christmas. Um, I was gonna say you can buy it online. I don't, I think I've taken it off. I don't think you buy it anymore. <laughs> Not that anyone is like, oh, I wanna buy your book, Sam. Um, especially when I tell you how it was written. Um, so yeah, I quit my job in August and basically then, what was it? September, October, November, three months. I tested the recipes. I wrote the book. I took all the food photos, which maybe in hindsight shouldn't have done that. But like, I've learned a lot about photography since then. Um, what else did I do? I edited it myself, which also I shouldn't have done, but like, I'm okay at editing. I did all that in three months. And literally every day was like super, super hyper-focused. And, and then I got it printed, I self-published, I got the hard copies printed out, I did a, uh, well, like a crowdfunder campaign. Um, but the downside of that was, I, first of all, I didn't know that was hyper-focus. I thought that was just how you were meant to get projects done, right, as quickly and as intensely as possible. So we got to December, and of course, like, I didn't do any marketing because I'm not very good at marketing. Um, <laughs> so nothing really sold. Uh, actually, no, I did... I pre-sold a few. I, I I did sell a few actually, and I've still got a few sitting in in my parents' house. But you know, we've all got that project somewhere, don't we? Um, so, but it got to December, and obviously it was gluten-free baking at Christmas, and um, Christmas came, and Christmas went, and then I was stuck there with these books, going, "Oh, <laughs> what happens now?" And I basically just crashed for months. I just struggled to do anything at that point. I completely burnt myself out achieving this because I was so focused on the end goal and never thought like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll get it printed by Christmas, but then what happens? Um, and the, the hyper focus was, I didn't know how to control it then. Not that it's really something you control. I think it's more something that you learn to work with, but yeah, hyper focus is a, what's the idiom? Double-edged sword. Right, let's get on to um, the other one. Um, so, I don't know who follows me on Instagram, but today I put something up which was, let me actually get it because I can't remember what I said. Um, it was, why does it take me so long to do anything? Um, so I asked, I, I, I took a photo of my kitchen that was, okay, it wasn't filthy, but it was definitely like we hadn't washed up the night before. There was stuff all over the sides. And I said, how long do you think it will take me to get this kitchen clean, including emptying the dishwasher? And it was like, I would say medium amount of mess. It wasn't like a completely filthy kitchen. And um, the results were very interesting, what people guessed actually. Um, some people guess. Some people said like three weeks, you know, and I think that's fair enough. Um, some people said like an hour, two hours, three hours, that sort of thing. And I actually guessed correctly. I guessed 20 minutes. Um, but it was really interesting to see how everybody, me, most of my followers are probably autistic or, you know, have autistic traits, I would imagine. Well, I, I'm guessing here. I'm assuming. Um, but most people guessed way more than... 20 minutes with the with the picture that I gave you know it wasn't like I'm gonna scrub the ceilings or anything like that it was just like clean the kitchen how long do you think this is gonna take and I, I, I guess 20 minutes but um I think I might have timed myself doing it before actually but when you are looking at a dirty kitchen going Ugh, oh my gosh it's gonna take me forever I always overestimate tasks and time I don't know what's called Time, your perception of time, your estimation of how long tasks are going to take is a part of executive functioning. And it's a part that I struggle with, but on the opposite way around. So I am an overestimator, which I think most people on my Instagram were. Um, pretty much nobody said, oh, it'll take five minutes to clear it up quickly, 
which I think is that might be more of a bit more of an ADHD kind of trait is thinking that things won't take very long and then sort of being late to things is that sort of but for me I'm the other way around I overestimate things I th I think excuse me this this <clears throat> this task is going to take me so long I don't want to do it <laughs> I can't even get started because it's going to take forever and it doesn't um and I, I don't know how to better estimate that. That's something that I don't know other than timing yourself, especially when it comes to tasks that you have to do frequently. Like how long does it take me to clean the kitchen? How long does it take me to vacuum the house? If you can say, oh, okay, vacuuming the whole house takes 15 minutes. Like vacuuming the whole house sounds so big. It sounds like a massive task, but if you say, well, it takes 15 minutes, I know it takes 15 minutes because I timed it. Then next time, you know, okay, I have got 15 minutes here. I'm going to vacuum the house. It's so much easier to start. And I say this like, oh, it's so easy, guys. I don't know. It's difficult. All of this is difficult. But um, yes. So I, I thought it was very interesting how most people really significantly overestimated the time it would take to, and it wasn't like, it was a few things on the side. Let me see if I can find the picture. I don't even know if you can. Let me find the photo. Oh my gosh, there's so many random pictures of stuff. Is that the clean one or the dirty one? No, that's the that's the dirty one. Let me see if you can. Oh no, you can't see it. Yeah, you can. And a few people actually said that kitchen looks clean. <laughs> Let me find the clean one. This one's the clean one. This is like your grandma saying, "I want to show you my holiday photos." Yeah, so the, the 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 surfaces are all oh the focus, um, but anyway, yeah. So time, your estimation of how long tasks will take, um, and I also really overestimate things like if I have to be in an appointment, I will generally arrive fifteen minutes early, even if I don't want to, just because I don't know. I think that's an anxiety thing. I'm very very anxious about being late to things. Um, so anyone, anyone, anyone. Right. Um, oh, somebody said I included the dishwasher cycle. Oh, no, see, see, I said emptying the dishwasher, not running the dishwasher. This is like, I'm going to pull you up on a technicality. I don't know. Um, right. What is the next one? Organizing and planning tasks. So talking about the kitchen again and uh, cleaning up the kitchen. I mean, I like to think of myself as a reasonably intelligent woman, um, but the planning involved with cleaning the kitchen gets me every time. And I can't think of a way around this. So if anyone has tips for me, that would be, I would really like to hear it. Um, because if you think about it, when you've got a dirty kitchen and you need to clean it, it's actually quite a complex task. Um, and it's not something I enjoy, which makes it even harder. So there are lots of different tasks involved in cleaning your kitchen and getting it back to kind of like reset. Um, so you need to work out, okay, some things need to go in the dishwasher, some things need to be washed by hand so you don't, you know, break them or whatever. Um, the stuff in the dishwasher needs to be put away before you can put dirty stuff in it, which always gets me. I'm always trying to put dirty stuff in a clean dishwasher. Um, some things in the kitchen might need cleaning up immediately or they might need cleaning up to prevent further mess as you go along. And some of it, you don't wanna be cleaning it up as you go along, you wanna wait till the end and then clean the surfaces. So it's like, maybe I'm just overthinking it, I don't know, but I find it complicated. And I'm one of these people that, I was, I was talking to my psychologist about this um, the other day, and I was saying how I'm, you know, I will open the dishwasher, put the thing in, close the dishwasher, go over to the other side of the room, get something for the dishwasher, open it, close it. And do you know what? And she said, but hey, it's a strategy if it works for you. And I said, it doesn't work for you, for me. It drives me crazy. Um, but there's something in my brain that cannot work out how to just leave the dishwasher open and then put everything in and then close it. Even though I know that that makes sense. I know that that's the logical way to do it and that will help. I don't know. Uh, so if anyone can help me, I don't know if anyone's had that exact same problem. Um, somebody says, I do that too, Sam. So it's good to know. But I don't know how to stop myself from doing it other than just 
I don't know, putting a sticky note on the dishwasher saying, leave me open until task completed. Um, so it's this, cleaning the kitchen is one example of a task that is, is a, it is sort of a concrete task, the kitchen must be cleaned, but involves a lot of subtasks and it involves you taking every single item and making a decision about where that item needs to go. And most of the time, well, a lot of the time there are certain items that always end up getting left on the side because I don't like to wash them. <laughs> so I'll leave them and my husband will leave them and then it'll be three days later. And eventually one of us will just, will just have to. Um, right. Let me see what is on the other. Um, Self-monitoring. So we talk about time management. Self-monitoring is also like monitoring how how you're doing at something when you're doing it um which is kind of like maybe not quite related to the the executive functioning it's also sort of self-monitoring your own internal needs so um something that breaks you out of your hyper focus because you are aware that you need to go to the bathroom um and you should probably go Whereas, you know, sometimes when I'm hyper-focused, it doesn't usually happen when I'm working on a project, but it's when I when I do play computer games, which is not super often, but sometimes, um, I find it really hard. I will just like really hold it and then uh, that's painful. That's not good for you to hold in your, your weeds. Good to go to the bathroom frequently. Um, so uh, I'm gonna show that one. This one's held for review because they said dirty stuff, which sounds very sexy, doesn't it? Um, why did I see that one? Yeah. Um, Gary says, does my husband get jealous that I'm talking to us strangers online? Um, no. My husband's actually on call at the moment, so he is technically moderating this, but he is also working. So um, no, he doesn't get jealous because I am not like, I'm not propositioning you, am I? Um, Somebody wants to block somebody. Other than go to the gym. That's not very nice. Um, there's someone called Amma Lyrical, the Frisian atypical reader. The other way to break it is to consciously change the habit. Yes, that's true. Ah. Oh. Who do you want me to block? Let me delete that comment. It's not very nice. I don't understand why I need to go to the gym though. <laughs> Remove. <laughs> the power is all mine. Um, somebody says, I use a magnetic two-sided sign for a dishwasher that says clean on one side and dirty on the other side. I could try something like that. Yeah, like open and close. I don't know. Although the clean and dirty thing probably would be helpful as well. Um, right. Am I wearing makeup? I look really pretty. I am wearing makeup, yes. I am wearing the kind of makeup that makes you look like you're not wearing makeup. Because I just wanted to have a not grey face. Um... Anyway, right. I'm not getting distracted by the chat because I kind of like, I like, I like chatting with you guys. Um, oh, maybe now is a good time actually to talk about the Discord server because I've got a section which is like, oh, I've got other things to talk about as well. But let me talk about Discord now um, because I've already been talking for 45 minutes. So I said it would be a short one, but it's not going to be a short one. Um, so a few of you were asking for like a community space to chat. Um, and so I've set up a Discord, is it called a Discord server or a channel? I sound like an old person, I don't know. Um, thank you whoever likes my sweater, my mum knitted it for me. <laughs> yes, I am, I'm cool. Um, anyway, this is, uh, I should have really like properly written all this down. Um, so a Discord channel or server or a group, a room, I don't know. Um, so basically it acts as like, a membership site like Patreon, but 
Patreon takes fees. So um, I'm going to do this through my Ko-fi, which I already have set up. So I have some details in the description box of this video about um, if you do want to join Discord, because that would be a really nice place, because then I can chat to people like without being live on the internet, which is distracting, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I can chat to people. You guys can also continue the conversation, not just when the time is, you know, convenient for me to be live. Um, so yeah, the instructions are in the, the description box, but if you go to my Kofi page, which is like, um, it's like a virtual tip jar, but there is a monthly option that you can choose. Um, and so if you subscribe to monthly option, it's like three euros um, or I think three dollars or, or something like that. Um, and then I will send you out a link to join the Discord server. And But I'm also going to be using it not just as like a chat room. It will be like where I post bonus content, um, depending on what you guys want to see. Like behind the scenes stuff is not terribly interesting. But like any bonus stuff, if I do interviews, I will give like the uncut version or the longer version of that. Um, and I might even do like some little giveaways because I don't really, you can't do giveaways giveaways on YouTube because they have very strict terms and conditions and Instagram, I don't, I don't want to just like have people follow me for the sake of it because <laughs> I don't want to just like, I don't want to give, do giveaways to just random people. I want to do giveaways to people who actually care. So, um, and not people who just want free stuff. So anyway, the rambly, rambly, rambly is if you want to be like a part of the Yo Soundy Sound little community, um, I'm just kind of like working, setting it up. So if you do sign up tonight, like <laughs> give me till tomorrow to do it. Um, but I hope that it will be a really nice community and we'll I'll set up some different channels for like general chat and specific stuff. And maybe you can meet people like in your local area. I just thought that it would be nice and people asked me for it, so I, I have delivered. And of course, if nobody signs up, then uh, egg on my face, right? Um, anyway, let's take a break from that blatant uh, plug for my own stuff and go back to the next one, which is working memory. Um, okay, Jack has been hidden. Don't worry, guys. He won't be back. I don't know what why people enjoy this sort of thing. Um, what were we talking about? Working memory. Um, so working memory is basically like your uh, your short term memory, um, your ability to hold things in your mind in in the present before they get kind of like catapulted to your long term memory. So catapulted because it's really like hit and miss what ends up there, right? Um, so, I mean, working memory is, as a very, very basic example, like if I were to tell you a string of numbers, like a phone number, although nobody remembers those anymore, but if I were to tell you a phone number, how many letters could you repeat back to me in that time? How, how long can you remember it for? Um, and I, I personally think that, um, oh my God. Somebody's just asked if demisexuality is lesbianism. No, lesbianism is lesbianism. Um, there's a whole video. Go watch the video. I can't explain now. Um, oh, God. This is what happens when I look at the chat, isn't it? Completely. Yeah, so I personally, my, my working memory is quite good. Um, some people, some autistic people's working memory is quite poor or average. It's not a, that in itself. It's not a sign of autism or anything like that. Um, but the way that that is actually a disadvantage for me is that I have a tendency to hold things in my working memory, which means that, and then when I get more anxious, I'll hold on tighter and then everything has to be held onto. And all of a sudden I am trying to remember everything instead of just writing it down, <laughs> which would be so much more helpful. Um, and, and so that, that impairs me in that way because it feels like my brain gets clogged up with stuff. And so that's why, again, that is why brain dumping is really, really helpful, not just for what I was talking about before, but to, to sort of like clear out your working memory. It's like RAM, yes. Yes, it's like your RAM, like computer RAM, not the sheep RAM. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. I'm going to need some painkillers before I go to bed, guys. Um, yeah, so brain dumping for working memory. Of course, if your working memory is poor, 
you will also need to write things down in order to remember things. So I guess the take home version, the take home message is that writing things down is probably the best bet, unless you prefer using apps and stuff. I can't use apps very well. I do use my Google, Google Calendar and a paper calendar, which seems like double the work, but it's actually not because there's a lot of times when I'm out and about, I need to write down the appointment. Like if I'm at the dentist, I'm like, I'm writing it down for six months time in my Google calendar, because if I write it down anywhere else, it's just gonna get lost in there. So um, writing things down or just getting them out of your head. So you're not having to rely on either poor working memory or good working memory that likes to hold on to things. Um, yeah, because I, th I think that's the thing. If you've got good working memory, that means your brain naturally holds on to things, which means that you might have pro trouble letting go if you don't do it uh, consciously. Um, so the last executive function, which is not actually, that there are a few others, but um, I had to keep it short uh, for the interest of this live, is impulse control. Um, and this is also more frequently thought of as something to do with ADHD, you know, blurting things out, um, you know, not being able to control yourself, um, not being able to control your impulses. Um, but I think the way that it impacts in autism especially is like you get a new special interest or just a new interest that wants to be a special interest and you just want to spend all day on the internet downloading everything you can about that subject directly into your brain. And so impulse control would be like not doing that. Um, and this is again, like with the hyper-focus stuff, it's really great that we have brains that absorb information on special interests. I think then there must be there must be a, an autistic memory. There must be a model of autistic memory because I really do think that our memories work differently to other people. I can remember very concrete details about things long ago. Of course, I, I forget a lot, but I do have a very good memory. And I also have a, a memory that seems to categorize things in slightly different ways. So I think autistic memory is something, I don't know if it's been studied much, um, but that would be an interesting thing. It would be interesting to study. Um, but I mean, autistic memory is, is fantastic that we can remember subjects in such detail. I mean, if you look, I don't know if you know the TV show Mastermind, it's a UK TV show where people go on and the whole point is that people go on with their specialist subjects. <laughs> Like the whole show is basically just autistic, so us. Um, but they go on with their specialist subjects and then they are asked questions on those specialist subjects. And it's one of those things, it's like a very bizarre thing that you would want to watch, but actually it's quite um, captivating. But that is that is special. Um, and it's weird how it's pathologized by medical literature, repetitive, restricted interests. Like that's a, a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because it means that we have a huge depth of knowledge rather than just like knowing a bit about, I don't know, something or other. It's like we know everything about Pokemon or, you know, Buffy or we know everything about like nutrition science or I don't know. I'm just pulling things out of my head now. Um, so impulse control, I guess a healthy way of dealing with that when you're you've got a special interest and you all you want to do is like look up stuff about that or do stuff about that is trying to find some balance that works for you and your family and I include your family because we live with people or well if you live with people you do if you don't then <laughs> you know does it matter I don't know um but you know if you live with people you have to find a way to ha have it work for the rest of your household. And especially if you have children, you can't just spend all day on the internet looking up facts about Pokemon, unless your child likes that too. And then that maybe is a legitimate use of your day. I don't know. Um, but finding this balance between, I want to do this all day, and but I have all these other obligations, I think is important. And I suppose scheduling in your time to be obsessive about something is, is a way to go. It's probably a, a good um, a good way to go. Um, 
so what's everybody anyone's saying anything interesting somebody's gonna look on pubmed yes please look on pubmed i really can't see it unless it's highlighted is this same guy spamming i don't know um oh my gosh i've been talking for almost an hour i'm gonna have to like <laughs> wrap it up at some point aren't i let me have a look um so that was the last one of the the, the sort of executive functions as it were um there are many more you can you can look it up the, the information online is not very good i actually think there is there is a bit of a gap for like really good comprehensive information about executive functioning um i would love to write a book or something on it but uh like i've got time for that right now uh, um but really the question that everybody has for me is like what what can we do what are your tips what can we do to help ourselves with this um and um well that is a very good question and it's a broad and complicated topic um but it's also like attention is really different from like working memory is really different from all these different things are quite different and separate and I'm actually kind of thinking that we need strategies for all of them that's that's how it feels for me like I need I need to develop a strategy for how I plan out my YouTube workflow I need to develop a strategy for how I load my dishwasher not load dishwasher but like clean the kitchen how I do the tasks what do I do first like I need to write lists but it's like there is no one size fits all solution for executive functioning um and the question I actually have for you guys, I know some of you might be on ADHD medication. I wonder, does that actually help with executive functioning? I don't know if that helps. Um, it probably helps with like the impulse control and inhibition and stuff, but I don't know if it helps with this, this sort of stuff. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned my previous video that I did, I did that about six months ago um, on how, how I plan my weekly tasks. And I'm still using that system six months on. It has been incredibly effective for me and my family. I mean, what did my husband say? He was just like, yeah, it's pretty handy. That's what he said. Um, he has ADHD. So it sort of helps, I think, for both of us. And he said like, it was more it was a more objective view of stuff it wasn't just like one spouse nagging the other to do stuff and he said it was a motivator and a shamer or silent judger all in one this little sheet being like you haven't cleaned the kitchen sink in three weeks that's disgusting go and clean it um which is um yeah it's it's true so um i linked that video if you haven't seen it in the description box uh because I, I find it's a very helpful system for organizing my weekly household tasks. I don't call them chores because like it's the messaging, isn't it? I don't wanna I don't wanna say I'm gonna go to do my chores now because that's already demotivating me. So <clears throat> I think I've managed about a third of this cup of tea. It's cold now, of course. Mm. But it's still um it's still minting somebody said in my experience with meds they made impulse control worse but one size doesn't always fit all yeah um Skandia says oops i've got to highlight my university does a lot of research on memory and autism a research post it please yeah send me that on instagram please um i would be interested to see that um so yeah what was the talk about the weekly the weekly task it it my house is not perfect i i kind of tidied up for this video <laughs> um i i still don't get everything done but the the best part about using this task system is that i'm not thinking about it all the time so i know that and i keep it on my fridge and i keep a little pen highlighter above my fridge and so i know that if I can't remember if I've done something, I can go and look. And then I can see I haven't cleaned this in three weeks, so I should probably do that. So if I have a bit of time and a bit of motivation to do something, it's not like I'm just wandering around thinking like, what's dirty, what needs to be done? I'm like, okay, I've been slacking on this, so let's do this. Or I, 
I cleaned that yesterday. I don't need to do that. It's really helpful. So um, yeah, I, I, I like that one. And I have kept on it for six months, which I've never kept on any system like this in my life for that long before. So um, right. Um, I think I, 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 I put a subheading saying, what can we do to help ourselves? And then I was like, this much. Um, clearly, I ran out of inspiration at that point. Um, somebody asked, do I know the Dutch word for executive functioning? No, I don't. Is that a rhetorical question? Please tell me if you know it. Um, anyway, oh, I'm getting distracted by people talking about meds. Yeah, I wasn't really talking about meds in a way to like, I was just curious to know whether whether they helped and with what kind of things they helped. Um, speaking of meds and ADHD, I do sort of want to, um, I want to talk about ADHD a little bit because as some of you might know, I've mentioned it a couple of times. I've been thinking recently, is this, do I need another diagnosis basically? Not that I would necessarily pursue one, but do, do I have ADHD or ADD? Not sure. And I'm, I'm seeing a psychologist at the moment for psychoeducation, which is a follow up to the autism diagnosis. <laughs> I was on the waiting list for like a year and a half or a year or something. Um, so I'm doing this psychoeducation module with my psychologist and she's very, very cool. I like her a lot. Um, and she's actually taken me seriously because when I've mentioned it to other, other people, they've been a bit like, Oh, well, you know, it's just one, one guy said, Oh, it's just, it's just a sign of intelligence that you've got racing thoughts. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but um, what my psychologist is actually doing with me is we are work. she took me seriously. So she's like, okay, well, I have printed out the DSM criteria for ADHD and she's not interested in whether she, she's not asking me whether I identify them. Well, she is as well. But what we're doing is we're looking at the criteria for ADHD and looking at the criteria for autism or the sort of generalized descriptions of autism and saying, okay, can this be explained by this? And what is left over that cannot be explained by autism? And we we got a little excited and got into it in the little bit of a nerdy way. Um, it's nice to talk to psychologists because they're like psychology nerds like me. Um, but as far as I can see from where we are at the moment, um, I don't think that autism and ADHD are really separate things. I think that they are both maybe different representations of, of the same condition. I'm doing this because this is the, the pattern that's making in my head. I have synesthesia and, and it does strange things to my thoughts sometimes. Um, so yeah, yeah. and the, the more I look through the ADHD traits and symptoms, the, the more I think, well, I do identify with that, but there is also like an autistic part of that. And it's it's really hard to tell the difference. I mean, I am definitely autistic because of the sort of the social and the, the sensory aspects um, of it. I mean, like my, my diagnostician said, like you tick every box. <laughs> she said, this is a very easy diagnosis to make, which I was surprised at. Um, ooh, sorry, pushing you away. Um, oh, somebody's said I made a video once about where I explained how different symptoms of mine and how they link to both ADHD and ASD. Yeah, and the, the thing is though, I, it's just, I don't know, there are so many different represent, representation, no, the, there's so many different, what am I trying to say? Um, ways in which people are autistic. Like some people are autistic in a very energized way. Like I am, I think I'm autistic in an energized way, unless I'm tired, but like my being is quite, energetic I'm quite extroverted and I like the person generally um there are a lot of autistic people who are quite a bit more like a different types um there's an artist who did really cute little um drawings um I I can't remember their name actually but they were called spectrum critters you can google them spectrum critters um and they're basically like little drawings of different characters that represent like different types of autism. And I, I, I was definitely like, what are they called? Like Blee and 
yin yin or something like that. Um, so I, I definitely related to two to certain types of them. And they were really cute little characters. And I thought that was such a nice idea because it's a really good way of showing the spectrum is little characters, um, sort of like My Little Ponies, but for autism, you know. Um, anyway, somebody said, have you ever had any marijuana treatments? Not a joke, proven positive effects. Um, I do live in the Netherlands. It's, uh, if not legal, at least uh, gray area enough. Um, yes, I find it helpful, but not for executive functioning, exactly. Um, <clears throat> let's see, there was another one. Um, somebody's asking me about Myers. Everybody always asks me about Myers Briggs, and I'm, I'm a Myers Briggs skeptic. That's based on like pseudoscience. I'm not, I'm not keen on it because like, it's, it just seems like astrology to me. It's not really based on science. The, 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 the psychology field is is flawed, but they have come up with what's called the Big Five, which are the Big Five like personality types. Um, I, yeah, and I don't know. I'm not really into the Myers Briggs thing, mostly because every time I take the test, I get a different type. Um, so, is there a type for that? Um, Skander says autism and oh, my ear just clicked, and I can actually hear. That's nice. Um, autism and ADHD make me think of when sometimes scientists decided different parts of the same dinosaur were two different dinosaurs. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Exactly. Yes. I'm so glad you you uh, you put that. Anyway, um, blah 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 blah. My Little Pony traits. Yeah, you can buy the Spectrum Critters. This the artist has it on um, on their website. I just um, seriously, you should be able to find it by googling Spectrum Critters. It's not a very common phrase, is it? Um, right. Somebody said Myers Briggs is BS. I was trying to say that in more like you know a nicer way. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, there's lots of people talking about Myers-Briggs. People really like the Myers-Briggs though. And they, whenever I talk about, it, especially certain some neurotypical people, I talk about my, uh, autism and they're just like, what Myers-Briggs type are you? Like really interested. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, right, so I've come to the end of my notes. I will remind you again about the Discord so server because I think it could be really cool. You guys, what, a lot of you say that this is like what your place where you come and people understand you. And if you can carry that on into a nice community, I think that would be really cool. And I'll be there. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so um, do check that out. All the information is in the description box. Um, do they have that for cluster B personality disorders? My Little Pony, what like My Little Narcissistic Pony or something? I don't know. I'm making flippant jokes now about like, I shouldn't be joking about things like that. So um, I think it is probably time to call it a night. I made it over an hour. So I hope you're all happy. Cannot believe there's still 224 people watching. Um, that's really cool. Uh, somebody's here for the Discord, yes. Um, <laughs> it'll just be you and me. <laughs> Um, let's just show this one because it's not a spam comment. I can't, it doesn't, does it show? Another moderator handled it. Oh, doing it at the time. Spectrum critters, yeah. Um, so, um, I, I, Tristan, I'll think about that. I'll, I'll, I'll see if there's a, a way to, to work that one. Um, right. What did I have to say? Did I have to, anything else to mention before I go? Probably not. Um, you guys, you guys are great. Um, it's really nice to, to sit and chat with you guys on a Friday night and, um, drink my tea or usually it's wine. I'll try and get a live stream done on a monthly basis. I think that's kind of like a good amount of time. And I'm also looking into some software, which means that I can invite people to, to like be interviewed so I can, not exactly do a collab, but just like invite maybe another YouTuber on to my channel and it'll be like a split screen and then we can we can talk. So I'm gonna look into the software for that. So maybe next month we could do that because I think that would be really fun. Um, so I hope that you all have a great weekend. I hope you enjoyed the chat. I am going to try and get 
regular videos out still every Friday. It has been like kind of a difficult few weeks, but I feel like my brain is on the mend. I'm not going to, I don't particularly want to talk about what I've done in order to mend my brain, but um, it's all good. Um, I'm just reading all your comments. Uh, it's really nice that you guys enjoy these chats. And um, yeah, I'll catch you later. Take care. Storm has been sat next to me, but um, I don't particularly want to disturb her, but she is right here. She has been enjoying the chat too. So I will, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.